I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our viewers to this presentation this afternoon. We're going to be discussing optimizing lumbar discectomy and specifically the subcategory closing holes in the disc. My name is Benjamin Kirshner. I'm a physician assistant from the Orthopedic Institute of Western Kentucky here in Paducah, Kentucky. I've been here in Western Kentucky since August of 2013, working exclusively in spine surgery, both from the clinical aspect, seeing patients here, and then also within the operating environment in a full scope spine surgery practice, including non-invasive conservative measures, all the way up through deformity corrections and rather extensive spinal surgeries. Joined today by my supervising physician, Dr. Brandon Stringy, who has also been here at the Orthopedic Institute of Western Kentucky now since 2010, 2011 timeframe. This program is provided by HMP Education and is supported by an educational grant from Intrinsic Therapeutics. Just a couple of disclosures for you. Uh, myself and Dr. Stringy are consultants with uh, Intrinsic Therapeutics, and Dr. Stringy is a uh, research partner with Intrinsic. Today we're going to be uh, discussing lumbar disc herniations and again, specifically the opportunities for closing defects within the lumbar intervertebral disc. We're going to be recognizing the complexity and importance of lumbar biomechanics and disc nutrition, explaining the factors associated with elevated risk of recurrent herniation and reoperation after lumbar disectomies, identifying the goal of an annular closure, listing both the available or previously used methods of closing the annular defect at the time of lumbar uh, disectomy and discussing the impact on the risk of herniation and reoperation. Also discussing the factors that define a patient likely to benefit from annular closure. So looking towards what patients are optimized for this procedure. And then discussing towards the end of this presentation, the steps required for implantation of a bone anchored annular closure device, including a techni technique video later on. Getting started here, we're gonna begin with disc anatomy. Uh, the intervertebral disc or IVD is made up of three main components. You have the vertebral end plates, both the superior and inferior end plates. These are concave surfaces above and below the disc. Now the concavity of those in plates does change over time. You will see with degenerative disease, a flattening of the in plate. That's one of the methods we use for identification of degenerative changes within the spine is a flattening of those in plates, losing that concavity. Secondly, the nucleus pulposus, or generically called the nucleus, this is the looser inner structure of the intervertebral disc made up of collagenous fibers, a softer type material, providing that cushion at the intervertebral disc level. And then thirdly, the annulus fibrosus, or the annulus, this is more of a highly organized and uh, counterangulated layer of collagenous fibers. This is that sturdy ring that provides a, essentially a capture point for that nucleus, keeps the nucleus contained within the intervertebral disc space. Of course, in the case of the disc herniation, there is a breach in this annulus as we're going to discuss further today. This diagram that we're seeing on the screen now provides a cross-sectional view. We're seeing both the annulus on the outer edges and then the space for the nucleus uh, within in the inner point, and then also note the vertebral in plates, superior in plate and inferior in plate. 
Here's a sagittal T2 MRI image, giving us a nice perspective on the intervertebral disc. This one demonstrates a pretty good concavity, both to the superior end plates as well as the inferior end plates of the vertebral bodies above and below the intervertebral disc. On this T2 weighted scan, you'll see that the whiter, whiter color within the intervertebral uh, disc at the nucleus level shows still a fairly decent degree of hydration, so suggestive of a process in which the degenerative disease is not significantly progressed. There is a bit of a posterior protrusion on this, that is on our screen towards the right, where the spinal canal, there is some displacement of the fecal sac posteriorly there. So a early disc space bulge noted on this screen. And once again, a diagram, cross-sectional diagram of an intervertebral disc with sections of the annulus fibrosis removed for illustration of those counter-angulated fibers. And this is a, a nice view here demonstrating that fibrous ring surrounding that looser structure in the inner disc space, the nucleus contained within that annulus fibrosis. Finally, we have a axial cut MRI image, once again, a T2 weighted in which we are seeing around the periphery of that disc space, the annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus within the inner disc space. Once again, showing some decent hydration. There's a bit of a posterior disc protrusion as was demonstrated on the sagittal view that we looked at a few slides ago. Moving on to disc nutrition, this is where we get into discussion uh, regarding the avascular nature of the intervertebral disc. It's actually the largest avascular structure in the body. Uh, we know that having blood supply is essential for bringing uh, chemical mediators that facilitate inflammation and healing after injury. Because the intervertebral disc is an avascular structure, it is uh, quite vulnerable to injury. The lack of blood supply, meaning that the cells within the disc must rely on nutrition by way of passive diffusion through the vertebral end plates rather than a direct blood supply. As mentioned, because the disc is avascular, it cannot heal itself by means of chemical mediators, the way other vascular tissues are able to recover from a injury. The consequence of that then is that internal disruption and damage to the disc material can be either a process that heals exceedingly slowly or doesn't heal. And certainly as the degenerative process progresses, we see uh, further and further loss of that normal disc nutrition, mainly manifest on an MRI scan as that uh, nice white T2 weighted appearance of the intervertebral disc. Moving on to some of these effects of aging and time on the disc, we're going to see in-plate sclerosis. The sclerotic tissues lose some of their capacity to absorb compressive forces, as we're going to discuss a little bit further on. There are certainly other factors that come into play when we're talking about in-plate sclerosis, such as heavy smoking, decreased blood supply related to other vascular diseases. The net result being a formation of sclerotic tissues. And this gets back to what I was saying earlier about the inflate losing its concavity is that as these sclerotic tissues are laid down, you begin to see more of a distorted appearing inflate on radiographic review. This can be manifest on any of our main three modalities, plain film radiographs, CT scans as well as MRI scans. Our image to the right is demonstrating cancellous bone above and below this section of sclerotic bone. You'll see a, a whiter appearance of it demonstrating a decreased 
vascularity compared to the cancellous bone, which is uh, higher in natural occurring blood tissues there. As I was mentioning, the sclerotic process or the sclerosis process affects the disc. It decreases the diffusion of nutrients. So it diminishes what is available to the disc material across the end plate. This results then in the natural degeneration process of the nucleus and the annulus as they lose that higher diffusive blood supply. And it stiffens the end plate reduces the in plate's ability to absorb compressive loads, which then requires the annulus to absorb an increased percentage of that force, that compressive force. And on the right, we'll see that loss of concavity with uh, on, the, on the right side of that image where you have a flattening of the in plate as a result of that degenerative process. Moving on further through that degenerative process, decreased nutrient diffusion. We see the formation of sclerotic tissues, flattening of the end plate, osteophyte formation, or generically what patients will refer to as bone spurs. As the end plates gradually get closer together, you may see some joining of those osteophyte complexes. This diagram illustrating a loss of disc height, which is a measurable parameter on radiographic review. There is natural variation in the disc height in normal anatomy, of course, too, with generally speaking L5S1 exhibiting a decreased disc height relative to the other lumbar intervertebral discs. Annular tears are another finding of the degenerative and sclerosis process generally on, a, and what you'll see on a T2 MRI scan is the increased signal at the site of the annular tear. This being a sign of weakening of the, weakening of the annulus, and perhaps then leading to a disc herniation even. You know, by about age 50, you're gonna have the vast majority of patients will present with radiographic evidence of the disc degeneration. Desiccation, which was mentioned as the drying out of the disc, leading to a loss of that higher T2 signal. You're going to see annular tears, diminishment of height. The nucleus is then losing its ability to sustain hydrostatic pressures and deform properly under compressive load. This loss of disc height uh, can then result further in instability. This increases stress, stress on facet joints and on the surrounding supportive ligamentous structures of the lumbar spine. Biomechanically, the lumbar spine, as well as the entire spine, but the lumbar spine has to absorb a tremendous amount of force. And these are complex forces too. These are not essentially forces applied in one vector alone. You're talking about multiple force vectors here. Just simple tasks such as bending over to pick something up, the disc has to accommodate, bend, twist, and compress, and it's not compressed evenly either. You may have more compressive force on the anterior portion of the disc, uh, lateral portion, or posterior portion. Uh, that pressure of the nucleus being pushed against the annulus results eventually in things such as disc bulges, further weakening of the annulus fibrosis, and then potentially even an acute disc rupture. An illustration demonstrating some of the complex forces, you have more anterior force applied on the intervertebral disc here and a stretching force on the posterior aspect. So that's important to note that the anterior portion, one portion of the disc can be under a compressive load while a different portion of the disc can be under a stretching load simultaneously. Disc bulges, now these are dynamic things. Uh, one of the limitations of MRI is of course, you're getting a static image. So you're seeing a disc bulge, but in reality, 
the disc, uh, when we're moving, are likely undergoing slight protrusions and intrusions just as you are moving about, naturally speaking. Here again, the posterior disc height is increasing as these annular fibers are stretched. The nucleus is then pushed back against those stretched fibers, and you have the potential for damage further to the annulus uh, or even breach of the annulus fibrosis under that force. Moving on to what this process can eventually lead to, specifically the herniated disc. When we're talking about how we treat that, there are certainly options leading towards the various ranges of treatment for that from the conservative measures to the surgical measures available to our patients. And uh, Dr. Stringy, I'd love to introduce you at this time into the presentation to talk to us some more about the treatment options available for a herniated lumbar disc. All right, thanks, Ben. As he stated, my name's uh, Brandon Strangy. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon here in Paducah. I've worked with Ben for a number of years. When we talk about the treatment of herniated discs, all patients are treated initially with conservative measures. Uh, the reason for that is about 90% of patients that present with symptoms of a disc herniation, which are mainly sciatica or shooting pains down the leg, numbness and tingling, 90% uh, of those patients are going to improve with non-operative care and not require surgery. The non-operative measures, uh, which most of you already are aware of, involve rest, sometimes physical therapy, occasionally we use epidural steroid injections, um, and a variety of other medications to try to minimize symptoms. Uh, oftentimes we use a medral dose pack uh, with uh, anti-inflammatories as an initial line treatment. But for the patients that don't get better with non-operative care, when we're considering surgery, uh, typically it's people who have failed at least six weeks of non-operative care or those that have had uh, more severe symptoms, like symptoms consistent with what we call cauda equina syndrome, which is somewhat of a surgical emergency. Those patients present with uh, numbness in their perineum, severe uh, symptoms of pain, and progressive neurologic defects. Anyone with really severe deteriorating neurologic function would be somebody that perhaps we'd move up that timeline. But generally, patients are given the opportunity to get better on their own because the majority of patients do improve with non-operative care. For the ones that don't improve, the surgery of choice is what's called a microdiscectomy. And uh, microdiscectomy involves going in and pulling out the herniated piece of disc. Uh, this is a very common procedure that's been uh, done within spine surgery for decades. Uh, in fact, it's uh, often quoted as the most common procedure that we perform. Um, these procedures are okay and they have good outcomes, um, but they're certainly far from perfect. Uh, there have been several huge studies involving thousands of patients uh, that show some of the problems with this microdiscectomy procedure. Uh, one of the uh, early papers was the Swedish Spine Registry, which was 2,800 patients that all underwent discectomies. Uh, and at one year post-op, only about 76% of the patients were overall satisfied. Not exactly a glowing uh, result. Uh, another study out of Washington State included almost 20,000 patients who underwent discectomies. And of those patients, about 13% of them required another surgery uh, within four years. Uh, this could be a, a surgery for a recurrent disc herniation, or it could be a surgery involving something more aggressive, such as a fusion procedure for, for that damaged disc space. Uh, another huge study out of Finland involving 25,000 patients, uh, they showed an almost 19% reoperation rate at nine years. Uh, so this is continuing to progress as these discectomy patients uh, continue on. What puts patients at risk for a, perhaps a bad outcome? Um, these are things that have been looked at and are actually pretty well known. Um, patient factors involve uh, older patients, uh, patients that maybe have a much higher BMI, um, taller disc height patients may be at risk for a recurrent disc herniation or another herniation because they have more disc material present. 
Uh, and then smokers generally don't have uh, as good of outcome. It's been shown that the size of the hole in the annulus has been discussed um, and earlier mentioned, the size of the annular defect is a big predictor in the risk for reherniation and potentially reoperation in general. And we'll get into that a little bit further as we talk about some of the newer options we have for closing the annulus. When you're doing discectomy procedures, there's, there's sort of two trains of thought. One is try to take out the least amount of disc possible. Um, and that has some pros and cons. The other option is to be more aggressive and take out more of the nucleus in the hopes that perhaps you're going to decrease that risk of herniation. The downside with that type of, of approach is that the more nucleus that is removed, the more likely that disc space is going to undergo degeneration uh, with its lice, loss of disc height uh, and potentially leading to more facet joint disease which are the joints in the back of the, uh, the spinal segment, uh, and then ultimately more back pain and potentially um, more aggressive surgery like a fusion. This, this is a picture showing those two techniques um, in a much simplified way, but on the left, uh, this is a tube where the nerve roots are being, or, or the central dural sac is being retracted to the side um, right here, and it's showing a instrument called a pituitary grabbing onto the disc fragment and trying to remove it. This would be more of what we would call a, a minimal discectomy. Whereas the picture here on the right is again, showing the retraction of the central dural sac and more disc material being removed. So this would be called, um, or can be referred to as a subtotal discectomy. This type of approach is obviously going to have a much less higher risk of reherniation but that's going to be definitely increasing your risk of degeneration of that disc space and potential other complicating factors. Uh, when you take out less disc, like this diagram on the left, you're likely to have a, a higher chance of a reherniation. So based on that, obviously preserving as much disc material as possible is going to be beneficial. Uh, the more disc material you're able to save, the less likely someone's going to have back pain, uh, as shown in the table to the right. Um, the white column is limited discectomy, and then the black uh, is more of an aggressive, uh, and it shows the incidence of back pain there. Uh, and this is well known from several studies. This is just one from McGirt et al. In terms of preserving disc material with less back pain, you're probably also going to have less, less disc height loss. Uh, and that goes along with more nucleus material to still basically function as it was meant to. Uh, and then possibly even keeping those facet joints in a more healthy orientation, which should decrease their risk of degeneration. Alternatively, if you do more of a aggressive discectomy, that's going to, again, decrease your risk of recurrence. Um, but along with that, the complicating factors we just discussed. So what if there was a way where you can remove less disc, but also prevent reherniation and reoperation? Um, and so that's the goal of the procedure that's referred to as annular closure. Um, the idea is to close or block the defect to prevent reherniation, but at the same time then retain as much disc material as possible and all the benefits that go with that. Um, not only decreasing your risk of reherniation or reoperation, such as a fusion, but also potentially protecting the facets, protecting the disc, and keeping that height as much as possible. Um, for this type of procedure to be successful, um, it really has to have a couple of features. Number one, it has to address the larger defects because, as stated earlier, the larger defects in the annulus are ones that are, are at more risk for reherniation. And whatever type of closure device you use, it has to stay in place. And that's important because there have been several different ways that this has been accomplished, um, but unfortunately not successful. So obviously closing the hole makes sense and it has been tried as I stated. The pressure in the disc, however, is extremely high. As Ben was showing the diagrams earlier, 
um, with the, the, the bulging of the anterior annulus as you flex forward, the posterior annulus has a stretching force on it. And this, the pressure within the disc as this study indicates, from, it's quite old, from 1976, but it was actually a pressure sensor that was put within the disc space and then asked a variety of subjects uh, to lift and bend and twist. And the pressure within the disc was measured at 334 pounds per square inch, uh, which, which is pretty impressive. So whatever type of annular closure device that you wanna to try to develop, it's gonna to have to hold up to that much pressure, which is, which is pretty astounding. One of the early attempts at closure um, was suture and simply trying to just suture up the defect. Uh, the problem with that is there's just no way for it to actually hold up to the stresses involved. Um, here's a picture from a study uh, that shows uh, cycles of the disc being flexed and extended and reherniation within 1500 cycles, which, which is, is, is really a no-go from, from, uh, from a uh, longevity standpoint. Annulex and Anchor Orthopedics have marketed suture-based closure devices, uh, but their published data showed very little benefit. At two years post-op, a second procedure was required in 11.2% of control patients and 9.7% of their x closed patient, which was the name of their device. This was a decrease of only 13.4%. Uh, which is not very impressive. So basically, it, it wasn't very successful in decreasing reoperations or reherniations. There is currently one implant available for closing the annular defect, and that is the intrinsic therapeutics barricade device. Uh, and this we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about. Uh, this is an implant that I was fortunate enough to use in one of their IDE trials. Uh, and now I've been commercially, commercially using it for uh, perhaps the last two years. Um, the implant is shown uh, in the uh, picture uh, to the left in a model. Uh, and then you can see the implant itself uh, in the uh, second picture from the left. It is a titanium anchor that is malleted into the end plate uh, just below the subchondral surface. And it has a flap made of a polymer that closes the annular defect and keeps the remaining nucleus intact. Um, here you can see on the, the third picture from the left, uh, a radiographic image of the implant in place. And then finally on the far right, uh, an MRI image of one of the implants where you see just a small amount of uh, artifact from the titanium implant. Titanium has been used within the field of orthopedics and specifically spine for a number of years uh, without any type of uh, issues. It's a very commonly used uh, metallic um, element and uh, holds well for this implant. You can see it's got some, some very small teeth uh, and once anchored into the end plate appropriately, uh, has a very low uh, chance of uh, migrating or anything else. So this, this checks that box of, of what is required of a successful annular closure device. Uh, this implant itself has been widely studied uh, with multiple publications showing its success, uh, as opposed to the uh, earlier suture type implants that had a very uh, small uh, decreased risk of reherniation. All of the publications for the barricade device have shown uh, an exceptional reduction in reoperation. Uh, combined, all of these seven studies, uh, which don't have nearly the number of patients as some of the early discectomy uh, papers, but certainly for an implant, these are impressive numbers. Um, starting with 274 patients showing a 72% reduction, and then all the way down to the most recent study, uh, which showed 120 patients with 100% reduction in reoperation for reherniation, which is very impressive. And all of these studies have a minimum follow-up of one year. Um, so overall, this implant has excellent published data uh, and has proven safety. Well, who, who would you use this on? Um, that's the big question. Well, we already talked about patients that have big annular defects as being one of the, uh, the targets for annular closure. Um, for me, as I'm seeing patients in the office, 
uh, I'm essentially considering all patients a candidate for a barricade device if they have a disc herniation and require surgery until they don't. And the things that make them not a candidate are very narrow disc spaces. So for this implant to work, the disc space has to be relatively tall, somewhere along the lines of about five millimeters as measured on your sagittal MRI cuts. Um, this is how much is required for the implant to accommodate. Interestingly, those are the patients also that would benefit the most because they still have nucleus in that disc that's worth saving, okay? Um, so those are the things I'm considering initially. Do they have a tall enough disc? And then intraoperatively, I'm thinking about, again, that defect, is it large enough? So I've had a couple of occasions where I've gone to surgery for discectomy and thinking I might need the barricade device, but the defect was so small and almost imperceivable that they didn't require it. So in those cases, it's not implanted. Um, but in patients that have a reasonably large annular defect, and usually uh, it's four to five millimeters and we measure it in both the height and the width, um, those patients uh, are great candidates for this type of device as long as they have uh, a disc worth saving, which in this case, uh, you know, is usually around five millimeters height, as I stated earlier. This is a uh, intraoperative photo uh, through a tube that we'll use to do a discectomy uh, showing uh, that annular defect. And then um, I have a case presentation that I'm going to go through that shows a little bit more of the implantation of the device. So this was one of my IDE trial patients. This was a 40-year-old male, uh, average build, BMI 29. There were his presenting x-rays, including an AP and a lateral lumbar film. He's got some mild degenerative changes, as Ben was referring to. Some of the disc spaces are a little narrow. He's got some osteophytes forming here between L2 and L3. Uh, there might be a little subchondral sclerosis. That's some of that degeneration process that Ben was talking about. But overall, these x-rays are relatively benign other than some mild spondylosis. Here, however, was this MRI findings. Again, this disc space looks healthy, has a very nice uh, hydrated annulus. The rest of these are somewhat in the stages of degeneration and variable degrees, really. But more importantly, this patient presented with back pain and right leg radiculopathy. And so when you look down here between L5 and S1, the patient had a disc herniation. And that's what you're seeing here on the axial cut. This is a piece of nucleus that's actually herniated out of the disc. This is the cut that just shows the free fragment. This is showing more of the disc space level here. That free fragment would probably be a little bit below here if we moved over on this sagittal image. This is a mid-sagittal. But this patient, for me, measuring the height of his disc, at this level, he still has plenty of disc height left. So he would be a candidate for the barricade device as long as the annular defect was big enough to accommodate him. Well, that's exactly what you do intraoperatively. So this is a fluoroscopy image intraoperatively showing um, a, a lateral of the spine. Here's my retractor. Here's my nerve root retractor in place, which is just gently retracting that dural sac medially. And then this is a measuring device that we put in the disc space to make sure that the annular defect is big enough to accommodate the barricade implant. This is after I've already cleaned out the disc herniation itself. Uh, and made sure that the pressure was off the, the neural structures. But once this defect is confirmed to be a full thickness all the way into the nucleus and of appropriate size, which in this case, it measured five millimeters tall by 10 millimeters wide, this is a perfect example of a patient that would benefit greatly from the barricade device. So the next step involves a trial. And so this trial is being placed in for a couple of reasons. Number one, to ensure that you have the appropriate trajectory of the implant within the vertebral body. We wanna make sure the anchor is at least parallel to the end plate or possibly even a little bit divergent from it, but you certainly wouldn't want that anchor to go towards the disc space. Um, that potentially could be a problem with maybe an end plate fracture or something like that. So you have to make sure that this thing is angled at least parallel to the end plate, but also what this helps decide, it's wide enough and replicates the size of the actual implant. And so you can make sure that your hemilaminotomy, which is the defect we make within the bone to access the disc herniation is large enough to accommodate the actual implantation. So in this case, 
the trial fit appropriately, but actually this is not quite the proper orientation I would use to implant. I think this should be a little bit further cranial to angle just the implant a little bit more parallel to the implant. This is more convergent. I'd like to see it at least parallel or, or, or divergent. And so that's a good example of probably the not quite the right alignment. The next slide here shows the implant going in and you can see I've corrected that angle to come in definitely parallel to the end plate of S1. And this is the metallic arm that holds the polymer. And then the anchor is within this implantation device. These are the post-operative images that show the barricade device in position. Here you can see the hemi laminotomy that I created to put it in and to actually do the discectomy procedure. And then this is that metallic piece that you can see anchored in. And then here on the image on the right, you definitely can tell that the anchor is parallel to the end plate and that the polymer piece is exactly where we'd like to see it, preserving as much of that nucleus as possible. So that is as close to the ideal position as we can possibly get it. As far as the surgical procedure itself, this is an example of one of the nerve retraction tools that we would use. Um, this is a consideration of what we call Scoville. Um, it, it's a somewhat wider uh, nerve root retractor uh, that gives you a little bit more safety in terms of implanting the device uh, and making sure that you have a clear visual field. Um, but other than that, the uh, other difficulties that you may have uh, are just maintaining visualization and this sort of thing uh, can, can definitely help uh, as you're putting it in. Uh, at this point, um, we have an excellent video uh, showing the entire procedure basically from start to finish uh, that was uh, recorded by Dr. Masaccio uh, showing not only the discectomy procedure itself, but also the implantation of the barricade device. Hello, this is uh, Dr. Michael Musaccio, and today I'm going to be discussing lumbar discectomy and barricade implantation. This is the case of a 56-year-old female with a left L4-5 and a right L5-S1 herniated disc. The video will take us to the procedure and implantation of barricade uh, for the left L4-5 herniated disc. On the MRI, imaging axial and sagittal T2, while we can't see the actual size of the annular defect, we can see that this is a broad-based disc herniation. The disc, posterior disc height is measured at approximately five millimeters. When planning my incision, I, I, I want to orient, orient my incision uh, directly over the disc base, so as I use the sequential dilators to, to, to insert the tubular retractor, uh, it is oriented in line with the disc base, and not tangential or oblique. This gives uh, more direct access and exposure to the thecal sac and nerve root. Once the tubular retractor is in place, I'm performing discectomy directly in line with the disc base. And when it's time to implant the barricade, uh, it ensures that I have the correct angle uh, to insert the base plate in parallel with the end plate and not tangential or oblique, which would be an inappropriate application. As I drill here, I'll drill that bone down to ligamentum flavum. I'll continue to thin the bone superiorly immediately and remove the remaining bone with keris and rongier. With all of my discectomies, whether I'm implanting barricade or not, so I'll perform a, a more medial laminotomy, which I find gives a better decompression and a better ability to control and retract the thecal second nerve immediately in order to safely perform the procedure. I also remove the ligament the flavum in totality at the area of interest uh, so that I can decompress widely and again have greater visualization of the thecal sac and nerve root to safely retract it and perform the procedure. And that's what we're seeing here as I move towards the right of screen, removing the ligament over the descending L5 nerve root. I'm now cauterized epidural veins and I'm retracting the thecal sac and nerve root medially with the nerve root retractor. And now I'm inspecting the ligament to identify any native defect and I make my linear annulotomy over the weakened part of the annulus and ligament. I avoid an overly aggressive annulotomy and ligament incision in order to preserve intact ligament. Here I'm delivering the herniated nucleus 
that is subligamentous but outside of the annulus, and I'm using a down pushing curette uh, to deliver immediately towards the annular defect. I reach into the annular defect. I'm careful not to perform an overly aggressive discectomy. I do want to remove any loose nuclear debris as that's already been rejected and is no longer useful. At this point, that loose nuclear debris only serves to be a risk of reherniation and is no longer being utilized by the native disc. We're now measuring the height and width of the annular defect. First, the height is measured at approximately four millimeters with uh, measuring tools that are increasing in size one millimeter increments. Now I'm measuring the width and I don't want to widen the defect artificially. I simply want to determine the size of the defect as it is. I've measured the annular defect at eight millimeters. However, I've selected the size 10 barricade device as I prefer to use the largest device for maximum coverage of the defect itself. Now I've selected a size 10 alignment trial and I'm placing the alignment tool first on the L5 vertebral body and then checking it as it would be implanted in the L4 vertebral body. And this allows me to see what is the best orientation for the device. Should it go into the inferior superior vertebral body and making sure my angle uh, gives an appropriate implantation. I'm now winding the tubular retractor inferiorly to gain better retraction and protection of the thecal sac and nerve root as I choose the inferior vertebral body implantation. Even through the 18 millimeter tube uh, with the thecal sac and nerve root retracted, I can clearly visualize the implantation tool and the barricade itself so that I can safely insert it with confidence that I'm not injuring the thecal sac or nerve root. This is the device delivery tool uh, with the barricade attached, lining it up again so that the base plate will insert into the L5 or 2 body. Uh, fluoroscopy confirms alignment. I'm taking periodic fluoroscopic images every few millimeters to ensure the base plate is inserting parallel to the end plate and that the polymer barrier is implanting appropriately into the disk space and deploying as designed. Now the implantation is complete and the delivery tool is removed with a simple maneuver superiorly and lifting out. And the elements of the delivery tool are, are blunt, there are no sharp objects, uh, once again limiting any risk to injury to the thecal sac or nerve root itself. And finally, I directly visualize the base plate, inspect that it is engaged properly, countersunk a millimeter two, and not protruding in any way. And the final AP and lateral fluoroscopic images confirm the proper implantation orientation of the device. Dr. Stringy, one of the unique aspects of what we do is that uh, you and I and physician assistants and surgeons in general uh, work in a very collaborative uh, team-based aspect that is something that carries us both from the beginning of our interaction with a patient, a patient presenting to our clinic for a consultation of some type of symptomology, the relevance to this case, maybe they present with back pain or leg pain, and being appropriately worked up at the introduction level, at the consultation level. And you and I have had the privilege of working both together and then also with several other physician assistants. This is a unique thing, wouldn't you say, in terms of the team aspect of how uh, we have to collaborate together to get the patient appropriately taken care of all the way through to potentially the surgeon, uh, the decision being made for a surgical intervention. Yeah, I, I agree 100%, Ben. Um, you know, we've worked together now for several years. And for me, uh, the physician assistant uh, plays a critical role in um, managing my patient load. Um, I have a very busy spine practice, uh, as most surgeons do, um, and it literally is impossible in today's uh, medical environment for me to take care of every aspect of patient care. Uh, and so for us, we have a wonderful system where uh, the majority of the non-operative care uh, that patients require uh, is coordinated by uh, my physician assistants, such as Ben. Um, you know, they're going to start a patient off with um, initial treatments, uh, whether it be anti-inflammatories and steroids, muscle relaxers, physical therapy, um, and then coordinating uh, the appropriate imaging studies that we require to diagnose a disc herniation. Um, once that uh, imaging, uh, all the imaging has been combined and the uh, 
uh, decision is made that perhaps the patient will require surgery, uh, that's when typically uh, I am brought into the picture. Um, sometimes sooner, it just depends on those particular situations, but oftentimes that's when I'm brought in. Um, you know, the physician assistant has really done all of the things um, to try to make someone better before surgery. And then when the decision uh, is to be made, whether or not surgery is indicated for that patient, that's when uh, I really step into the decision-making process. And uh, after I evaluate sort of the imaging and review the things that someone has tried to get better, uh, ultimately, if their imaging study matches their symptoms uh, and um, they've done the appropriate things to try to, got, try to get better and haven't, uh, that, that's when um, you know, the decision to make surgery uh, is up to me. I then have the opportunity to see the patient uh, and uh, describe the radiographic features that they have in my words, uh, which oftentimes is the same as already been described to them, but it's different to hear it sometimes from the surgeon. Uh, and then to, to just discuss the specific uh, aspects of the treatment that we're recommending, whether it be a simple discectomy or whether it's a, a discectomy with something like this annular closure device. Um, then, then when it comes to the actual surgical procedure, uh, for me, it's imperative that I have um, either Ben or one of my other physician assistants with me uh, to help manage the surgical environment. Uh, not only is there managing of uh, the, the, the orders and, and the, the, the tasks to get ready to do the procedure, such as the draping and those sorts of things, but intraoperatively, um, you know, the physician assistant plays a huge role uh, in assisting with nerve retraction uh, and then uh, down to the wound closure and application of dressings. Uh, there are several procedures where uh, the physician assistant is helpful for actually the implantation times um, where I need things held back so I can have the access I need uh, to appropriately place implants. Um, and, and that co continuum goes right to the uh, the post-op care, uh, where again, physician assistants in my practice are critical for uh, managing some of the common post-operative problems that patients may have uh, and, and sort of getting them through the, the post-operative recovery uh, all the way through the physical therapy afterwards and then return to work. Uh, and, and so for me, uh, you know, it's, it's extremely important to have a, a well-educated team uh, approach to taking care of patients. Uh, and, and the treatment of a, of a discectomy patient is, is, is perhaps one of the most common ones that we see. Yeah, awesome. And, and that's, off, that's where you get into that whole idea of PAs being uh, physician extenders, because our role is essentially to uh, act with your uh, supervision and uh, with your expertise backing us up. We are extending your treatment to a much wider population of patients that allows us to facilitate uh, taking care of more folks and getting them back on the road to recovery and healing. I, I think it's also worth uh, commenting on within the intraoperative setting, within the operating room environment, when we're working together, we're trying to achieve that state of flow where you're not having to ask for specific things to be done, but it's being done uh, automatically. Uh, so suctioning out a wound bed or providing retraction, as you mentioned, having the right instrument in hand, being able to anticipate, being able to know what happens next. And one of the things that you've taught me is to always be thinking several steps ahead so that I'm ready. There's no delay. We call that in the operating room efficiency of motion, right? Like we're not wasting time. We're not increasing unduly uh, operating room time, which has a wide range of potential complications, not to mention just the increased load upon the uh, hospital as uh, OR time costs, as we all well know, are quite uh, extra, can be quite uh, extravagant. So efficiency within the operating room, efficiency of movement, anticipation, but the only way to get that right is by time spent working together and, and completing many of these cases so that we achieve that state of anticipating each other's movements. And when it happens, when it is going well, it, it's a beautiful thing I, I, to see. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of because uh, we're working collaboratively, we're anticipating each other's moves, and you do 
achieve that state of uh, almost subconsciously just knowing what's going to happen next. And folks like to talk about when you're in that flow state, 10 minutes goes by, an hour goes by, it feels like two minutes. And we've seen that happen before. It's a, I, I think that's one of the most unique and special aspects of the physician assistant surgeon collaborative relationship that uh, I've had the privilege of participating in over the past eight years, for sure. Yeah, and I, I guess I would add to that, um, you know, with that efficiency and with that flow and anticipation of what I need to do the procedure, that's what leads to the best surgical results. Yeah. So ultimately, we're all there for one reason, and that is to take care of a patient's problem and hopefully get a good outcome. Um, right. And with experience and, and with that collaboration that we have, um, that's how you achieve the best outcomes. And then you have the, the happiest of patients. Um, and, and it's just really, it really it builds upon itself. Agreed. Awesome. And, and to go back to some of these considerations that we were discussing as it directly relates to physician assistant, where a uh, first assist working on this case in particular, the retraction within the field is somewhat different than our standard disectomy, mainly as a result of our trial or measurement instruments, and then also the implantation instrument in a standard or non-barricade disectomy, we're not implanting anything. So the hand placement requiring slight adjustment, this mainly relates to providing a little bit of extra exposure, extra retraction during those additional fluoroscopy uh, shots that are taken that aren't part of a standard disectomy or an uninstrumented disectomy to expand on that further. Yeah. And that, that's something that I think has taken us a few cases to sort of get a good work, workflow on. Um, yeah. Not only do you have, we use a microscope when we do the microdiscectomy procedure, um, you have to use the microscope then to actually see what nerve you're retracting and then the appropriate placement of the implant for implantation. Um, but then also we're using a fluoroscopy machine as well, which generally on a typical discectomy procedure, it doesn't require fluoroscopy other than to confirm that we're at the correct level. So we're sort of working around the microscope, the fluoroscopy machine, uh, and then needing to get the proper amount of retraction at the same time. Uh, and so this, this requires a little bit different positioning of the microscope so we can work together at the same time. Um, but definitely is something that has taken a little bit more time. It's a, it's a, it's a definitely more, um, than the standard discectomy procedure, but certainly something that we have adapted to. And now we've done uh, plenty of these, uh, not only within the study, but also, uh, you know, in, in commercial placement. And um, the biggest thing again is, uh, you know, minimizing complications, minimizing OR time uh, and, and getting a good outcome, which involves for this, particularly making sure that implant is placed appropriately. Um, and I think we've come to a, a, a very good system for that. Yeah, I believe so as well. Uh, we've seen positive results from this. To expand further on the uh, minimizing complications, one of the ways in which we minimize potential complications and in general within orthopedic surgery is the revolution of minimally invasive procedures. And as we've been working together over the years, we've seen lots of almost revolutions in the way that some of these procedures are performed to make them increasingly less invasive. But in order to do so, we do have to rely on additional uh, assistance by things such as operating more under a microscope, spending perhaps even a little bit more time under fluoro. And as you, as you discussed, adapting to that, getting your hands to do what your mind is telling them to do while looking at a screen, you're almost playing uh, 4D chess there to some extent where uh, you're having to see what's going on within the wound field by way of looking at fluoroscopy or by way of looking at microscopy at the same time. And, and that <laughs> wrapping your mind around that is a challenging thing. And however, you get there, you get there, you can, you can get to that point of being able to see what's happening, even without directly visualizing uh, what's occurring within the wound bed or within the surgical field. Uh, you mentioned the placement of the trialing device, either more cranial or caudal in that aspect, sometimes in our early cases, 
it was hard to remember, okay, which way do I move my hand up or down to uh, get it to reflect on the fluoroscopy appropriately as we wanted it to. But again, that's, that's time, time and cases have uh, gotten us to that point. And that's some of the stuff that actually becomes fun in the OR then. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Good at that stuff. Um, w- one thing I, I, I would bring up, uh, you know, specifically regarding the barricade device, um, as I have implanted this uh, several times, uh, some of the questions that come up uh, regarding the implant that we really didn't talk about yet in the presentation. Um, you know, we talk a lot about re-operations and re-herniations, and we're hoping to prevent that with the barricade device. Um, but what happens if it doesn't work? Um, you know, what if there is a re-herniation or if the disc space does degenerate further despite putting in the implant? Um, while this hasn't happened in my practice specifically, uh, I only have a few years of experience with this. I don't have decades, um, but I have seen examples of the barricade device um, then requiring afterwards uh, some sort of free fusion procedure. Uh, and I've seen some excellent images of the barricade device still in position uh, with a fusion procedure that had to be performed, whether it be through an ALIF or an anterior procedure or a lateral procedure, or even again through another posterior procedure such as a T-LIF. Uh, these are all fusion type uh, procedures that we do. Uh, and generally the, 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 the party line um, with people that have had to do that is that it doesn't matter. The barricade device doesn't preclude you from taking care of a patient, however they need to be taken care of in the future. Um, But the idea is hopefully you're going to prolong the life of that disc space, maybe prevent completely the need for another surgery, but certainly um, push that way off into the future. Um, But but the question is always, well, what happens once it's in there? Well, nothing really. It's there and hopefully doing its job. Uh, but if they do ultimately require surgery, it, it can be done in, in the same standard fashions, uh, really without considering the implant being there at all. All right. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about lumbar microdisectomies, uh, acute lumbar disc herniations, to cover a bit of anatomical considerations, surgical considerations, some of the technique, and to spend some time discussing more of the uh, specific aspects of the physician assistant and surgeon relationship. I hope you all have the opportunity to incorporate some of the things that you've learned here into your own practices. Best of luck out there. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for listening today.